In this episode of the show, I want to talk to you about the three elements that I include in my basic mixing channel strip. That's coming up on Home Music Studio One. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Dave Maxey here, your host, and uh, you are either listening or watching episode number 32 of the Home Music Studio One podcast. Glad that you are joining me once again. It's glad to be back with you again. This is the place where you can learn to produce professional home recordings, and you can do that on a limited or an amateur budget. You can also find us online at homemusicstudioone.com. Well, here's what I want to do in this episode. I want to talk to you about the three elements that I include in every channel inside my DAW uh, as I begin mixing. These are the three plugins that I install first in order uh, that I use for every channel on my DAW and then I build upon that. In order to do that, though, I want to start by kind of explaining and prefacing this just a little bit. If I, uh, I've got a project here that's open in Reaper and I just created a, a project, inserted a single track, and then just clicked on effects. And then underneath that, I've clicked on all plugins. Uh, now this includes uh, every plugin that came with Reaper, uh, as well as the JS or the community developed plugins that came with Reaper. And then uh, as well as uh, thirdly, the, the plugins that I've installed. So there's several VST uh, packs that I'm using currently. So if I just scroll through the list of all plugins, I literally have hundreds of plugins that I'm looking at before me now. And uh, I find that in, in one sense, this is great because I've got another option. But on the other side of the coin, there's kind of an Achilles heel to this whole idea that inside the box, it's really the sky is the limit with the amount of choices we have when it comes to plugins and what we use. And I talked a little bit about this in the past that it's important to kind of simplify what you use. Uh, here's the big picture and the big mindset of what we need to do today and really why I want to talk about this. I find that the simplest way to get results, okay, and that's really what we're after, right? We want professional mixes. We want results at the end of the day. The simplest way to get results in our DAW and actually create projects that sound amazing, that sound professional, that are ready to be mastered and ready to roll out to the masses is to simplify the process that we are using. And here's the guideline that I really use with that. Because I think in a lot of ways, uh, though there's a lot of different options inside the box, honestly, it's starting to get just crazy. Technology has just skyrocketed the things that we have available. And, and what you're going to find is if you don't find a way to simplify what it is you're doing, all the features in front of you will really kind of be like a deer caught in headlights. It can really create gridlock. It can create this idea that, okay, I don't know what compressor to use now, but I have 10 of them. You know, I don't know what reverb I should use, but I've got 15 different ones to choose from. And each reverb has about 100 different presets in it. So which one should I use? I'm not really sure what EQ I should use, but hey, I've, I've got 10 different EQs. I've got parametric, I've got linear phase EQs, I've got uh, the turnstile ones, and I've got all sorts of different uh, interfaces to any kind of EQ that I want. So hey, great, which one do I use? Well, the simplest way to really kind of narrow down this idea is to build a basic channel strip that emulates what you would have available in the real world if you were in front of a studio console creating a mix. And uh, I find that not everyone uh, really uh, likes this idea. Sometimes we, we're just addicted to new things, and, and I get that. Sometimes we, uh, we love the idea of just having lots of different options. Uh, I get it, but yet at the same day, at the same time, if you really want results, this can be a super helpful thing to you, especially if you're learning and you're just trying to get to the place of actually achieving finished projects in your DAW, okay? So if you had a console in front of you and you had a channel in that console, you would have uh, a preamp typically built into that studio mixer. And I'm talking about in real life here, if you were in a studio, okay? Uh, from that preamp, you're gonna have probably an XLR input, a balanced input. Uh, you might have a quarter inch input that's probably uh, an unbalanced input. And then you might have a direct out as well as a channel insert. Those are gonna be some of the first elements on that mixer. 
uh, that direct out may be patching uh, into uh, an audio interface or some type of digital analog converter, maybe a hard disk recorder that's taking a direct out from each one of those channels in that mixer and uh, and pulling that into some type of recording, either hard disk or uh, just a in the box recording through some digital analog converter. But if we begin to follow our channel strip down in that mixer, you, uh, as I said, you may have a channel insert. And in that insert, you may have nothing plugged into it if you're recording in a studio, or you may have just a, a simple uh, compressor plugged into there. One compressor that maybe maybe there's a noise gate on it or just basic compression where you're just kind of kissing the signal a little bit. You're just compressing that that signal that's recorded a little bit. But my point here is you've got one compressor. You don't have 10 different compressors that you're tweaking at the point of tracking. Uh, or even if you're in the place of mixing, which is really what this is all about, when your uh, individual tracks are fed back from your digital analog converters or just fed back from your multi-track recorder uh, into your analog board in order to mix, you may have access to one basic compressor on that channel. You file that channel down, you might have, uh, you know, you're going to have your basic gain, your gain input there. From your gain input, you're going to have uh, potentially maybe some aug sends and some matrix out, some other different options. But you're going to find that you're going to typically have one equalizer on that channel, okay? You're not going to have seven different EQs to choose from if you were in an analog board. And that EQ may be simple, okay? You may have just a three band and your middle band might have a simple sweep to it. Maybe it's a, a, a couple of different sweeping options. You may have a low mid that you can sweep. You might even have, uh, you know, if you're doing really good, you might have an analog mixer that has a low uh, cut or a low roll off on each channel that you have access to. Following on down the line, you might have a basic pan knob on that mixer. You might also have then uh, a, your typical fader on that channel. And then, of course, your solo, your mute, those types of things are, are typical in an analog mixer. So how is it? that we take the basic mindset of that, and obviously that's not exactly, exactly what every analog mixer would have across the board, but that's a general overview. How do we get from there to jumping inside the box? Now we've got literally hundreds of different options that we're trying to build our mixes with. And before you know it, with these hundreds of options before us, uh, we're not achieving results at all because we spend our time really tweaking plugins. We spend our time reaching for something else Open that one thing is going to be the next holy grail. It's going to really give us the sound we're after. Okay. So here's what I do. I think to myself, what would I have in real life if I were sitting in front of an analog console creating and building this mix? Those are the basic elements that I at very least want to have to build my basic channel chain. So the first thing that I include on every channel if I'm building a mix is some type of console emulation in the box. All right. And this is some type of plugin. I'm going to give you a few options here that I use. Some type of plugin that is creating either a basic tape feel that could include some type of saturation, a little bit of what we would call good distortion, a little bit of breakup. If the track is loud enough, just on the very, very top end of that can kind of help glue things together. Something similar that if an analog board were driven at just the right way that would emulate the color and the sound of that analog board. Okay. And so the first thing I include is some type of console emulation that very often includes uh, saturation. Maybe it's tube emulation. Uh, one free plugin that you can use uh, in order to do that is actually uh, this right here, Saturn from T West Productions. Okay, uh, this is a plugin that allows you to actually literally in install this on every channel in uh, your DAW, and then as well as every bus, and it actually has a channel and a bus option. And this is just a basic console emulation, gives you the ability to include some drive, which is similar to uh, saturation, uh, gives you a, a few features, some crosstalk options, which can emulate similar crosstalk is basically when one piece of outboard gear has a little bit of bleed through from the piece next to it. So you might have two channels that have a, a touch of bleed through one to another, not completely independent, depending on the setup. You can emulate that as well. Uh, there's a few other different options on here. You've got a low pass filter, a high pass filter, 
Of course, an output gain there. Got some nice little uh, UV uh, style meters in there. Of course, a stereo monitor, uh, a stereo mono option if you want to preview certain tracks in mono. So some nice little features, but the first thing you're going to want to add in a basic channel strip is some type of console emulation. And uh, this from uh, T West is a, is a really great option in order to do that. If you're watching the YouTube, I'll make sure to put a link on that as well. Uh, for those of you that are listening to this audio, uh, you can head on over to helmmusicstudio1.com forward slash uh, 32, and that'll take you to the show notes of this episode. I'll make sure to have a link uh, in this uh, for the show notes as well. So the very first thing I, I include is some type of console emulation, which very often includes saturation or, or some type of light drive uh, just for the typical top end. I'm not applying heavy amounts of distortion to uh, my tracks, but just a, a light, light, light on the very, very top end. Um, and then, uh, you know, this type of console emulation has a few other features as well. Here's another option. This one is something that I've used and come across a little bit newer to me. Uh, but I'm really impressed with what it offers. Uh, and that is the strip plugin from sknote.it. That's sknote.it. And there's actually uh, two options of this as well. One is made for a channel strip. So it actually has some EQ function built in as well as the UV meter, uh, but it can emulate four different types and styles of consoles, uh, two different tube models uh, that are analog as well as two different solid state models. And you get a completely different tone and sound with that as well. I often, uh, in fact, I'm working on a project right now where I've got this installed on every individual channel. And then there's a bus version of this same strip. Okay, so it's strip bus version. And the bus version actually has some, some compression options as well as that console emulation. The idea is that the first thing you're hitting in your channel strip is you're creating as much as you can the, uh, the analog emulation of an outboard console. And there's another option in here uh, as well. It's a little more about emulating the tape. But that is also the Ferric TDS uh, from Variety of Sound. Again, I'll put links to all these that I'm mentioning uh, in the show notes. Head on over to homemusicstudio1.com forward slash 32 to find those show notes. Uh, and so this is another thing that you can use. Uh, the, the tape style sometimes lends itself more to kind of the end of your chain, but this will also work as well if you want to create a little bit of breakup saturation in the beginning of your tracks. Uh, and I will say that these are very, very subtle changes in uh, the effects here. Okay, so they're very subtle options that you want to include. They're not something that by themselves will create massive difference. They're something that collectively, if you have some type of console emulation in every channel, will collectively make a difference to the end result in your project. Okay, so the first thing I include is some type of console emulation. Uh, you might be interested to try one of those options that I've mentioned there, but narrow it down to one uh, that you use, maybe two max that you use often, and then just begin to learn how to use them well. You don't need 10 different options. You don't need uh, you know, 10 different options and, and 75 different presets in each of them. Narrow it down to one or two that you can learn how to use well and get great results in a finished product, okay? So the second thing that I include in uh, my basic channel strip is a compressor, okay? And I find that many times, depending on your DAW, one of the most efficient compressors that you can use in just a single band compression often is the compressor that comes built into your DAW. Many times, uh, if you're gonna have this option on every channel, uh, you're gonna get the best use of resources often on the, the basic compressor that comes in your DAW. Uh, in the case of Reaper, the Recomp is uh, the second thing that I include in my chain, just a basic uh, compressor. One, one thing I love about this guy is that it supports side chaining. It has a high pass, low pass filter so you can tailor what you're compressing. Uh, it has a pre-compression option on there. Uh, some of your DAWs might have a function called look ahead. And so this just allows the compressor to scan that WAV file into uh, to actually in milliseconds compress prior to uh, the audio itself uh, being run through. And so a lot of times you can just tighten up your mix a little bit, uh, depending on what it is you're you're compressing. So uh, your basic attack and release are in there, ratio as well as knee values. Uh, and of course, it actually has a limiting uh, limiter output. So uh, if you want to make sure that that track is not clipping on your compression, you can do that as well. A wet dry mix so you could use this for parallel compression mix those signals uh, i find that this just got some great basic options into getting used 
to using your basic compressor that might be typically part of your DAW or maybe something that came with your audio interface is a great way to go. Now, the next thing that I'll include in my chain is just a simple equalizer, okay? And again, on the same thing to be true, that using an EQ that often comes with your DAW can be super helpful and many times the most efficient when it comes to computer resources. So uh, the fact that I'm using Reaper, I often reach for the re-EQ. This is a, uh, a linear phase style EQ, if you will, or parametric, if you will. In other words, we have the ability to control the bandwidth of our frequencies that we're boosting and cutting, have the ability to make them shelves uh, versus just a single band. I have the ability to have a high pass, low pass filter or notches. And so we've got a lot of control within this EQ. What I love about this is to have unlimited bands, okay? So these really are the three basic elements in the order that I typically include on every one of my channels within any project that I'm working on. Now, the question that I often get when I mention this is, okay, do you use compression first or should you use EQ first? I often wanna use EQ first, and so why wouldn't I do that? Well, uh, the answer to that is simply yes. Um, I find that for the most part, this, this uh, interface works where I do a little bit of light compression first because that's often what I would do if I were in an analog mixer. However, uh, you can actually reverse the orders of these plugins depending on the source. If you've got something that is really uh, having a difficult time, maybe you've got a, a microphone that uh, needed uh, some low cut in it and you've got a lot of boom that's, that's represented in the microphone but it's not represented in the vocal. You may wanna put an EQ first and, and roll off some of that low before you then hit your compressor. Uh, but then from there, you just simply add another EQ on the back side of that compressor and then tailor on uh, the project. So depending on how well your tracks were recorded, I often compress first, but there really isn't a right or wrong. It just depends on the material. And then from here, uh, there's nothing wrong if you need to, to add an additional EQ or a different uh, compressor in the order. But I find that you can really accomplish a lot with just this basic setup right here and uh, learn to use this basic setup well, your mixes are gonna come out far better than if you had 16 different plugins on one channel and you're really trying to sculpt the sound 10 different ways from Sunday. Uh, it's better to learn how to use a few plugins really, really well and then uh, you know achieve great results than it is to have access to a whole lot more and then just not know how to use it. It doesn't matter how much you've paid for a plugin if you really can't use it well, it's really of little value in my opinion. So this is the basic channel strip that I always start with. Um, from here, uh, you can always build upon that. As I mentioned, uh, if you needed to EQ first, then I would often uh, maybe slap another EQ after that compressor and think of my first EQ as a little more repair my second EQ after compression as a little more tailoring of the sound to build it into a blending well with my mix. So cannot stress this enough. If you really want to achieve results, this is one way that even though I've talked about simplifying your plugins in the past, this is one way that I actually apply uh, what I've talked to you about and just really simplifying the, the options that I have so, hey, guys, uh, if you have any more questions, let me know. You can leave a comment at the bottom of this video. And then if you haven't joined us in the online community yet, now is a perfect time to do that. You can join literally the thousands of people that are signed up on my free affordable home recording tips newsletter. And uh, you can do that by heading on over to freerecordingtools.com. And just as a thank you from me to you for joining that community, uh, I'll begin to send you super helpful tips weekly. Uh, in your inbox as well as instantly a free copy of my ebook entitled understanding compression in the home music studio a lot of super helpful information in there uh, that's become a very popular uh, resource for a lot of people so uh, if that's you head on over to freerecordingtools.com and until next time this is dave maxi with home music studio one <laughs>